The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Frankly Speaking. I'm your host, uh, Frank Zaberek, and I'm excited about this uh, n n um, issue we're going we're gonna to talk about on this episode. First of all, happy 2019, where this is a new, the, my first show of the new year. Hopefully not my last show of the new year, but I'll have to um, work harder this year to get more guests, I think. But um, I'm really excited. Um, my guest today is a gentleman named from uh, the, uh, the town of Merrimack um, named Josh Moore. He runs a, um, a nonprofit 501c3 called the Patriot Initiative. And their motto on their website is inspiring the silent patriots to rise up and restore their culture and government. So, with only for, for the, first of all, welcome to the show, Josh. How are you doing today? Doing good. Thank you, Frank. Okay. So, why don't you tell my TV audience a little bit about yourself, as well as this um, uh, nonprofit called the Patriot Initiative, and why you got started, and what's it all about? Yeah. So, I, I kind of go back a little bit in history here. Uh, just take a couple minutes and talk about that. Sure. I've served now in government for four years. I got out just this past, well, just last year, 2018, this last election cycle. I did not run for re-election. Uh, so I ran 2014 and 2016, winning uh, my second term then. Uh, served on the Education Committee for all four of those years. Oh. And, um, yeah, I learned a lot there. And throughout my time serving, I would say probably uh, the end of my first term, and the beginning of my second term, I I was having a, not, I wouldn't say a struggle, but I was watching the people and listening to the people in committee, and I thought to myself, we're having conversations about issues, and we don't even have the fundamental principles laid out to be able to have these discussions in the first place. We're talking about school funding and everything, you know, um, and even moral issues. And I'm looking at this going, why are we even talking about this when we should have this issue, more, the more rooted problem, cleared up? So that being kind of a, a, a vague um, statement about it, I say that to say that we um, basically came, became up and running, was it last June is when we had our first meeting. We became a nonprofit status in, I think, August. So the goal behind what we're doing uh, is to restore culture and government. And as we move forward and we're looking back on what has happened over the last four years, really over the last two years since the presidential election of 2016, uh, I, I came down to this conclusion. I said, okay, the government is a reflection of our culture. So we keep fighting tooth and nail to get a good man or woman elected to public office. And no one's really paying attention to the fact that we need to be go out going after the hearts and the minds of not only the youth, but everyone as a whole. The heart is the problem, the condition of the heart, which is something I've always believed. And if you can go after that, right, and we can restore the heart, you can restore all the, all the things we've got going on. We can have a solution to the problems we have going on uh, across the board. It doesn't matter what it is. That's what I tell people. All these issues that we see nationally and statewide happening to us that we're facing all boiled down to a heart problem with the individual and within the family. That has to be restored first to restore every issue we've got. So that's where it came about, the Patriot Initiative. Uh, and I've met up with several people along the way who have been very passionate and excited about the vision we have. And so, yeah, the, uh, the, the goal behind it, again, is to restore culture in government. And uh, we're looking forward to putting on forums and trainings to help people with that. And I can go into that if, if you'd like me to, but that's kind of... Shoot, now, where would you... Do you have the housing, the facilities all in place to have these training forums? Yeah, we're getting them lined up. So, <clears throat> so the w here's the way it's going to work. 
The forums are going to be open to the public, everybody. Nobody's excluded from attending a forum. The forums are there for the purpose of, the res of restoring culture, which is part of our vision and mission at hand, right? So through these forums, we're going to have cultural discussions on, you can name whatever it is, whatever we're facing as a country, uh, racism, sexism, Second Amendment, free speech, anything relative to the Constitution, family values, uh, science specifically, maybe dealing with climate change, things like that. We want to deal with all of this, but we want to make it relatable to the founding principles of America. Right, and begin to sort of re educate people and show people here's the different perspectives you may not have heard of, and here's how these issues relate to the founding uh, principles that our nation was built upon. Right, and so we go forward to that. That's open to everyone. And when we, we're going to have panelists that are going to be statewide known and nationally known, uh, they're going to come in and provide their insight. And again, it's a forum. So, after the panelists are done speaking and providing their insight, we're going to have the public people come up and ask questions of the panelists or, or make, a, make a comment that may be on their heart, follow it up with a question sort of deal. I mean, people know what forums look like for the most part. So, that's the way it's going to run. In parallel to these forums, we're going to have a separate section of the Patriot Initiative, which is, is separate in the fact that we're, it's not open... It's open to everybody, but it's going to. We're, we have a specific agenda within the trainings, and that is to say, when you come in, we hope that people through these forums are inspired to defend the founding principles of America. That's that's the hope and, uh, that we we have with these forums. That somebody goes in and says, "Wow." I really am inspired by what I, what I've heard today at this on, on this issue from the these people on the panel, you know, the the experts on this issue. You know, I haven't really heard that before. I, I'm I would really like to learn more. They go to other forums and they say, you know what? I've been going to these forums for a little while now, and I I have a f newfound perspective on these issues that really hits home with me in my heart. You know, then that facilitates the mind and heart shift, and at that point they can come to our trainings where we're going to actually talk about constitutional leadership and the, the intellectual knowledge and the foundational tools that you need to be a principled and effective and solid leader in public, in, uh, public policy when it comes to politics and government. And so that's the goal. So people are going to look at these trainings and go, oh, well, that's not really open to people who maybe, uh, I, I hate to put a, a term, of, a political term on it, but maybe moderate or, or left-leaning or whatever, right? Because that's not what this is about. This is about the universal principles of freedom and liberty based on the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, which come from a very uh, old book, the big, the, the good word. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's wow. Where and now, um, well, kind of a, a sensitive issue, but I know uh -huh. you did have um, a GoFundMe page, but you told me off, off camera just before the show that you're kind of dissolving that GoFundMe page. Well, the GoFundMe was uh, an initial start to get us funding uh, because we didn't have a bank account at the time. We didn't have a legal uh, setup. So that was the initial part. That was a while back last year. Uh, now that we have that, it's I mean, it can still be used. People can donate, but why donate to GoFundMe? We can just go straight to our page, you know, and uh, and it'll be all. Also, there is an option on. There is an option on the, our website. Um, the the um, Patriot Initiative USA dot org. That's correct. For donations. That is correct. Yep. Okay, and the 501c3 means you can donate. I mean, you can uh, c um, file on your income tax at the end of the year. That that's um. A tax-deductible donation. That's exactly right. So that ain't bad, right there. Not bad at all. Now we have it all set up. And now I guess you told me also that um, you and your team, um, I guess you have like a handful of people now uh -huh. that are going to work on the training and, and stuff like that, the yep. training forums. Um, like right now you're not getting paid, but hopefully, you know, down the road, you hope that these donations will help you out. I'm yeah, in that regards. Absolutely. Like any organization, um, you know, you put your heart, soul, sweat, blood, and tears into whatever you do because it's from the heart and, and you're passionate about it. And uh, that, that's how I feel about the Patriot Initiative. I love engaging culture and I see the solution. I recognize the problem. I have experience in government to uh, make sure that it's accomplished and that we succeed. You know, I know the inner workings of the State House of New Hampshire, and uh, you don't have to serve in other state legislatures to at least know that much, to know how the political game works, uh, to, you, to know how to engage with people. 
and um, and unify in a conversation and talk civilly and respectfully while standing your ground. I mean, these are all things that you need to know and you have to have experience in. And uh, I certainly have that. I'm very confident in, in what I've engaged with over the last four years. Um, been involved in politics for six years. So uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But that's, that's, that's where we're at. I, I just thought of something. Is there another standard in the United States that you're, you're aware of similar to to the the Patriot Initiative that you kind of like used as a model, like a role model or a standard bearer to kind of follow along in. Yeah, there are a number of organizations that are uh, statewide and national. Um, the the three that immediately come to mind really are uh, one of them is very popularly known as Turning Point USA, founded by Charlie Kirk in 2012. Okay, but you also have Young Americans for Liberty and Young Americans for Freedom. Uh, those are two other organizations very similar. Uh, both of those organizations tend to have, if you look at them in depth, that one tends to lean one party line versus the other one. So um, like Young Americans for Liberty tends to go more libertarian, whereas Young Americans for Freedom tends to go more conservative, right? So, uh, but there's a lot of issues that are overlap within those organizations that are very good. So there's a lot of common ground there. Um, as far as the model modeling goes, um, I would probably say that we're much more similar to Turning Point USA than anyone else. But I, I think that they're all kind of similar in that fashion too. You know, each of them. I mean, if you look at uh, Young Americans for Freedom, uh, they have a lot of different national names they pull from, like Stephen Crowder, and they also have Ben Shapiro. And Ben Shapiro comes in, and they do uh, a forum type of deal there as well. But they're not doing the same thing we're doing at all. Ah. <laughs> uh. so. And, I mean, one thing that I think is sad, I mean, as far as, like, the culture goes in, in America, is the college campuses. Yeah. I mean, something needs to be done where they're protesting, like, uh, Ben Shapiro yeah. or Ann Coulter, and they can't guarantee the safety. So, like, at UC Berkeley out in, in um, near San Francisco, they can't speak or else they might get physically hurt or something like that. Yep. And yet, you know, back in like the 60s or 70s, you'd let them speak. And if you, you know, maybe you'd get your um, nose pushed in in a debate asking questions to Ben Shapiro or Ann Coulter or something like that. But you learned from that experience. Yeah. And now the college, I mean, the college kids are going through an experience where they don't have to do that. They just threaten them or threaten them with physical harm. And then they pull out from, from doing that. It's it's bad. It's very scary, and that's a that's a cultural problem. That is a cultural problem. That's something one of the many issues we'd love to deal with, and have it bring a solution to. So yeah, yeah. you're right. And it's uh, as far as college campuses go, uh, our target really is the youth. We are not exclusive of anyone else. We invite everyone in. We want all ages involved in what we're doing with the Patriot Initiative. Uh, but there is a certain, we, we do target the colleges and high schools. Um, we're actually, in fact, uh, we have our foot in the door, two college campuses right now, and uh, possibly a third. So we're working on that too, working on the high schools. High schools are a little tougher only because uh, you have to go through some of the adults in, in the school, right? And they tend to be a little more um, not receptive <laughs> towards certain political or ideological views you know and you have to go through the adults first because they have to have a legal face to the each group you know that that you're going through so it's a little bit tougher but hey that we're not that's not going to stop us you know we one of our biggest things that we believe in the patriot initiative is dialogue we want to have dialogue to the exchange of ideas freedom of speech is something we very much believe in and that's very important and we believe in that because not only uh, is it a freedom uh, within the Bill of Rights, right? But we also are confident in what we believe enough to discuss it without getting angry because ideas are where everything starts. So, To the best of your knowledge, I, I'm just curious yeah. if you ever heard anything about this because I guess it happens in other places. Well, I guess there was an incident in Texas in, in a fast food restaurant where a kid was wearing, like a teenager was wearing a Make America Great hat, one of those Red America Great hat, uh -huh. and one of the guys just blew a piston 
in his head, and he took the he took his hat, he took his drink, and threw it in the, oh, yeah. in the kid's that face. That was last summer. Okay, there's no incidents like that in um, well in New Hampshire. Probably during the 2016 election, there's always uh, campaign signs that get stolen. But was there any like physical like vandalism to cars that had Trump stickers on it or uh, not? No, okay. not to my knowledge. There were stolen and damaged signs, but unfortunately that happens most election cycles. Well, yeah, you probably had but, signs stolen in your yeah, election. So. I did. There, but that's, uh, as far as assaults go, no. No, I, I don't, I, not to my knowledge. I, I haven't seen any of that. That could be partially because we're a constitutional carry state. <laughs> but even before we passed constitutional carry in 2015, 16, uh, we we're still uh, laxed gun laws, thankfully. So uh, New Hampshire's just always been kind of that cowboy state, if you will, you know, where we just live free or die spirit. And okay. And we can carry whenever we want, wherever we want. So it's great. <laughs> Yeah, I think in the 2020 election, I, I'm definitely not going to have a sticker on my car for president. No way, Jose. Yeah. I'm just going to, you know, mind my own business, go to the polls and vote and then come out. But it's sad. It's sad, it sad. that we're in, a, we're in such a condition now that uh, people can't wear a shirt or, or a, a hat, hat yeah. or a pin or anything on their person that illustrates what they believe in or, ex or is some sort of expression of who they are and what their personal opinions or beliefs are without the threat of being physically assaulted or uh, verbally assaulted, right? I agree. You know, I say verbally assaulted. I mean, people today, you know, especially if yeah. people can, uh, espouse the more conservative view, they say, oh, for words, you know, well, words do mean things and words do matter. I actually personally believe that. I just, I'm not a, what do they call it? I'm not a snowflake about it, <laughs> yeah. you know, but words are powerful, so... Especially, you hear like these horror stories, like if a kid wore a Trump for president shirt at school, and the teacher starts berating the kid. Yeah, yeah. It's, or it's, disciplines the kid or something like that. That's, uh, that's definitely wrong. It's a problem. It really is a problem. Yep, I totally agree. Okay. Take it back. So hopefully there's no incidents like that in New Hampshire and... Hopefully not, not to my knowledge. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, what I'd like to do now is kind of bounce off a few, like, New Hampshire uh, issues off you, especially since you spent the last four years in the New Hampshire State Legislature. Yeah. Um, I had a friend of yours oh, about um, a year or maybe a year and a half ago, uh, Representative James Spillane. Yep. I believe he lives in Deerfield, New Hampshire. Yes. And his he's very... Um, pushing, um, well, I guess one of the things he's pushing, I don't know how many issues he's really um, advocating for, but he was really big on um, having um, New Hampshire um, inspection, auto inspection stickers um, terminated. Right. He said that there's no need for it. And he was telling me that there seems to be a problem. Like in the New Hampshire state legislature, they only pay you guys 100 bucks a year. So it's mostly like retirees and businessmen who serve as state reps and state senators That's who correct. have the flexibility to do that, some of whom are probably auto service owners who deal in inspection stickers. Yep. So long story short, have you sat in any sessions with the um, inspection stickers up for vote? Oh, yeah. Whether not only that, but I, so not just the inspection stickers, but actually I introduced a bill in 2017 uh, that was going to eliminate the OBD2 inspection requirement process uh, when, on your vehicle inspection. So when your engine light, that would cover your engine light, um, your uh, emissions inspection, because I think the emissions thing is, is a, a crock of poo, if you if you will. Yeah. You know, it's just it's so totally subjective. Um, having done research on it and everything, so I was at least I put in a bill to at least eliminate that. Nothing else but that, and even they didn't go for it. Uh, yeah, it was it was, and I had I actually also had a colleague of mine who owns an auto shop as a co-sponsor because he's a current state elected f official as well in the house. So he was on my bill and came in and helped testify before it. They still didn't take it. So I said, oh, my gosh, uh, my, our own party leadership opposed it. I said, this is getting out of hand. This is ridiculous. This is what I'm talking about. This yeah. is 
One of the many reasons why I've started the Patriot Initiative, because we want to raise up new young leaders who are principled and will stand on the Constitution as the supreme law of the land, both state and federal, and have a moral foundation to run with as well. So they're making the right decisions, principled, law-abiding decisions. And, and that was a perfect example. You have these squishy, if you will, um, party members who go in there and they, they, they're, they're just making decisions that are affecting people. Poor people are being affected by this, you know? So, um, you know, you're like your check engine light goes off. I've had it numerous times. And I know people run into this problem. Your check engine light goes off and you take it to the shop. They say, we don't know why, but it's got to go off if you want it to pass. Wait a minute. You don't know why my check engine light is, go is on, but in order for my car to legally pass inspection, it has to be off. Yeah, it happened to my parents' vehicle, and it was, it was just... A, a ridiculous thing, yeah. So some people, I know one person who's having to leave their truck in their driveway, a perfectly working truck. They've had three mechanics, I believe, look at it. They said, there's nothing wrong with this truck. It's just the check engine light is on, and it's be acting squirrely, and no mechanic can legally pass it without that going off, turning it off. Incredible. And that's what I'm saying. That's why we passed the bill and said, this has got to be done with. Stop with the check engine light. Stop with the emissions thing. Everything else, windshield wipers, tires, rust, okay, fine. We'll, go, we'll work with that for now. But this stuff has got to go. They wouldn't go with it. So it was a problem. But to go to your more specifically to your question of the state inspection stickers, I was a co-sponsor with Jim Spillane uh, on his bill to make it, well, actually, it was the first time was to remove it. Was to remove it, and then I think we put one in where it had, um, if your car is five years or newer, right, you don't have to go through an inspection process. Isn't that kind of ridiculous? You buy a brand new car, yet you still have to get it inspected. Now, depending on what shop you get it at, I think the inspection comes with it, right? Like the first time, and and I think you get, if you get a certain deal, you can get it like for the two years or whatever. But overall, you still, if your car is three, four years old. I mean, cars start, to run in some, run in, start running into some issues, but nothing worthy of a full-blown inspection that they require every other car to go through that's old. And what's more ridiculous is the fact that if your car is an antique, so I think 20 years or something like that or older, it's exempt from inspections. Yeah, you I don't, did not know that. You, if your car is an antique in New Hampshire, it is exempt from state inspections. So I don't understand why a brand new car that j is brand spanking new uh, and, and passes all the EPA regulations and everything else the government loves to throw in there, brand new, but you have to get it inspected and pay them money to do it, to look it over. But a car that's old, beat up, and been existing for 20 plus years or whatnot, is totally exempt because it's an antique. doesn't make any sense. And now, let me guess, if I was a, de a staunch Democrat, I would probably bring up a, 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 an incident where somebody who had bogus brakes killed a little kid on a tricycle. Or somebody with bald tires slid on, you know, hydroplaned on a, a, a ice, black ice or something like that, right. and killed a kid sledding or something like that. You know, what about those incidents if you eliminate the inspection stickers? Well, as far as eliminating the inspection sticker, uh, stickers, um, one of my things that I always fall back on, one of the main, main principles is live and let live, right? I mean, that's all, especially since you brought up the, the party of the Democrats, that's usually the only argument they ever use or the point that they ever use is live and let live, you can't judge, we have to be a tolerant society, but yet you're going after somebody's freedom to drive a car on the road, yet you don't want to give them the freedom to carry a firearm. You want to give 13-year-olds the uh, opportunity to have an abortion without mom and dad's knowledge. You want to take away their right to go to a tanning booth. That was passed in 2015, I believe it was. So there's all these things. We want to censor words and um, censor f free speech because certain words offend people. But we can't let you drive on the road when you're a responsible person. You know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different points you can kind of take it as. Yeah. But if we're going to apply that principle to one issue, we should probably apply it to all issues, right? You know, and that's kind of where I go with it. I said, let's, let's be consistent with what we're talking about here. So, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a great issue. And I hope, I look forward to one day uh, being able to pass something like that, that we can finally um, put a reprieve on the poor people here in New Hampshire. Those who don't have a whole lot of money, they need a, they have a car that, can drive safely on the road. There's just a few things that won't pass inspection and maybe somebody could help them out and they can get to their work and their job so they can make money and support their family and boost the economy, right? Yeah. <laughs>
Another issue uh, we talked about uh, before the show, um, we talked a little bit about how um, New Hampshire seems to be a mirror image of Massachusetts, yep. where you have a republic. They both have Republican governors, and all the state officers and all the federal officers appear to be Democrats. Right. <clears throat> And um, one thing I don't want to be a mirror image of Massachusetts about is state income tax and state sales tax. Yep. Do you sense the New Hampshire um, Senate and the New Hampshire House of Representatives may be prodding in that direction? I, I, I Sure. I think that they're, they're heading in that direction. They always have headed in that direction. Uh, to say that you know, it's heading in the exact makeup, um, I don't. I don't think they're trying to mimic anybody. I, that's just the natural uh, course that um, that man takes, if you will. One thing that I'm trying to do, and this goes to more of a fundamental issue, which is actually touches right back up on the Patriot Initiative and what we're doing. I, I'm lately, especially, I've been trying to get further away from. Are you a Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, libertarian, whatever? Yeah. Um, those titles matter. Titles have a purpose for existence, right? They help us to understand each other at face value and to quickly grasp. Okay, so you're, you know, you're a conservative or you're a, or a liberal or whatever. Although these words have been totally redefined, and we're working on that too. Actually, I'm writing a book on the redefined words and how to bring them back to the original definition of 1828 dictionary for Noah Webster, right? Having a standardized language. Um, but I'm always telling people, I said, look, in order to have a real good, fruitful discussion, we've got to push aside the, the, the terms for a second, you know, liberal, leftist, whatever it may be, and let's just have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. I want to know why you believe what you believe, you know? I want to know where, where that comes from in your heart. Like, genuinely, why do you believe what you believe? And I actually have done this several times where I said, I'll sit here for 30 minutes. I want to let you say whatever you need to, even if it's as offensive as possible. It doesn't matter. I'm going to listen to you, and I'm not going to get angry with you or anything, I promise. You could say, I, can, I want you as a dude to burn at the stake because I hate what you believe. Okay, fine. Why do you want me to burn at the stake? You know what I mean? Yeah. That I, I, I'm willing, I want to have that discussion because I'm confident enough in what I believe that I can at least get a, someone that's uh, opposes what I believe to question themselves. And the, the key, again, is not to make someone feel embarrassed or get themselves angry and put them on the defensive. That is not the goal. The goal is to present fact-based evidence, right, and, to, and, and logic and reasoning to the opposite opinion and let them know, do you disagree with what I'm saying? And if you do, why? And that's kind of the, the goal and the key. So I have actually had that conversation, and that's worked out really well. It doesn't always work out. Yeah. Some people get angry, right? Yeah. But it it's usually pretty uh, provides for a really fruitful discussion, so it's nice. So in your experience, getting back to um, mm -hmm. the um, if New Hampshire will ever adopt a state income tax and yeah. a state sales tax, mm -hmm. has Chris Sununu ever had a bill from the New Hampshire state legislator in, in imposing, uh, you know, trying to impose that uh, among the state, and he rejected it. Yes. So, or is your your question, I guess, is uh, it came before him, right? Is that this yeah, it has, it, it has come before Yes, him. it came before him last year, I want to say, or the year before. I always get my, I've been there four years, I get things mixed up sometimes. But um, it was sort of a semi, uh, uh, what am I thinking, income tax. Um, a little bit of a tough one to explain, but, so I won't go f uh, really into it that much, other than to say there was a bill presented. But more so, and you asked me before the show, Will, is there a chance that one could go through? Well, considering the House is made up of Democrats and Republicans now, or I should say is it really has the majority of Democrats um, in both House and Senate, is it likely to go through the House and Senate and pass both chambers? Yes, because that has become that party part of that party's platform, right? Will it get past the governor's desk, who is a Republican and has run on opposing tax increases and fees and, and supporting small businesses and the taxpayer of New Hampshire? I hope not. I hope that he doesn't cave. There were issues that I, I disagree with the governor on, and I told him that uh, in person. And uh, we had a respectful disagreement, of course. But I, I told him, you know, 
that this can't go through. So I'm wondering, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that he doesn't cave on these issues as they go forward if there's an income tax. Again, the session just started. I haven't even taken time to look through the bills yet to see what's come through. The Patriot Initiative, just to make it clear, is not a lobbyist organization. When I say I want to look through the LSRs, I mean me personally. I'm curious about what's going through, but I haven't had time to look through them yet as a personal prerogative. Uh, so there is that. But hopefully that answers your question in that we th there is a likelihood it will go through both houses and pass, but we hope the governor vetoes it. So I mean, probably the reason the people of Massachusetts and New Hampshire elect Republican governors is to probably have some kind of checks and balance have at least some semblance of checks and balances in both states. That's the idea, yes. <laughs> I'm not so sure that our culture is that in tune to what is going on. Not even necessarily New Hampshire. New Hampshire, we, we're, we're a very smart state. I mean, there's p smart people in every state. Yeah. But if we're being honest with ourselves, there's a lot of people that just don't know what's going on, right? And it doesn't mean they're stupid. There's a lot of very smart and intelligent people who are not, are not even paying attention to politics. They're just going out their daily lives, working their job, boosting the economy, the whole bit, but they don't care about the politics going on. And that, to some extent, is... Uh, the fault, again, well, it's really the fault of the culture again, because politics and cultural issues have become so molded together that now everything is politicized, and now nobody wants to bother to take on the problem. And so now everybody thinks, oh, we're done. You know, so this goes back to what you were saying, where people intentionally wanted a Republican legislator, and, I mean, a Democratic legislator and a Republican governor. I don't really know. I mean, we, could, we say that all day, but I think people just vote because it was the cool thing to do half the time, you know, oh, I know that's a household name, you know, um, or, uh, oh, my favorite yeah. person this year is running, and my friend, boom, you know, something like that. Yeah. And well, so Nunu <clears throat> does have a reputation in New Hampshire. His yeah. dad was, and his, his brother was senator, a U.S. senator, or was he the governor before? Uh, I think his brother was U.S. senator, yes. Okay, yeah. yeah and his dad was, and his dad was governor. Okay. I, did I say his brother was senator? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Making sure I said that right. But that's not back to and to make my make sure I was clear in my comment too as well. Um, ideally, yes, the people of New Hampshire and every other state and the nation as a whole should be voting on their elected officials based on their policy, their opinion, their worldview, what they think is going on, how to s solve the problems at hand. Uh, but that's not you. Half the time, that's not usually the case. You got about half, uh, more than half the people I would say that are just very strong in their opinions. Maybe some of it's emotional, but uh, there's a lot of people who go in there. And people told me they said, "Yeah, I vote for you, Josh, because I know you." And you know, I mean, I like what you believe, but I know you personally. You're a nice guy, or whatever. I said, "Okay." I mean, yes, ideally, I would much rather them vote on me because they believe in what I believe in. They agree with me, but that's not the case. So. Uh, I've had. Uh, I know you just mentioned you don't want your your the Patriot Initiative is trying to get away from like labels like Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, right. et cetera, et cetera. I've heard several people. I'm from Massachusetts. I moved up here in 2002, sure. and a lot of people, political influential people, says in Massachusetts the majority of voters are independents or unenrolled voters. Is this if I never really did any research research to find out if that's true. But uh, do you know for a fact if New Hampshire is mostly unenrolled or independent voters? Most of New Hampshire is independent and has been independent for a very long time. Um, most districts are independent. And um, I know that Merrimack is. It, we're mostly independent. The, the deal, though, is when you start talking about, you know, oh, we're an independent state, but those independent voters, registered independent, still have to take a ballot for one party or another. Yes. So there are not really independent. You know, only in general election can they really be independent of the fact that they're, you know, I'm going to vote for, you know, four Democrats here, four Republicans here, you know, whatever. In the primary, they got to take one or the other. Yeah. Right? So, and there's something really interesting about this whole conversation on being Republican, Democrat, and independent. And, and this touches back up on what the comment you just made about the Patriot Initiative and us getting away from the, the titles and, and, and the names here and stuff. Or the labels, I should say. My views, just to give the viewers an example, my views would be very considered very conservative today, right? My views would be very considered very, very conservative. However, what I tell people is... So there are inalienable rights we have. There are natural rights we have that most Americans don't even know about. Well, they know about, but they don't know of the, of the term natural rights, like life, 
the right to life, the right to self-defense, the right to own your property once you've acquired it through purchase or back in the day when there was a land rush or whatever, but you put your spike down, boom, you've got it. Things like that. Or there are rights that we have that we're born with. And when when we're talking about these these labels, it's almost as if, you know, Oh, well, the right to life and the right to self-defense is a Republican issue. Well, it shouldn't be. That should be a, a, that's a natural right that everybody in America recognizes. But unfortunately, they've become politicized issues, and that should not be the case. I was just watching somebody on the other day on Facebook talking about it. They said, you know, well, it's a good thing because this, this, this country is not just made up of, of one uh, perspective. It's made up of multiple perspectives. Well, hopefully those multiple perspectives should agree that natural rights should be protected. Protected, but they don't. That's the problem. That's what we've got to get back to understanding. And just like in the New Hampshire State Legislature, to the best of your knowledge, in the House of Representatives and the New Hampshire uh, Senate, State Senate, how many independents members are there? Probably zero. Well, considering <laughs> you can't run as an independent, there are none. Uh, you it, cannot <clears throat> run as an independent? Not to my knowledge, no. So you actually have... Uh, libertarian would more or less be the independent party, if you will. Although it's really not independent, but <laughs> um, yeah. there are there are were excuse me were three libertarians in the state house. They did not get li elected as libertarians though in 2016. They were elected as Republicans, and they switched libertarian halfway through their term. Yeah. Then they were unelected. <laughs> so, and I'm not knocking the Libertarian Party. Yeah. There are a lot of things that I like about the Libertarian Party. You know, not socially, but again, this goes into a whole other topic of, of things that we could to a whole other hour on. Because this is, this is good stuff we're going to cover in the Patriot Initiative, which is so much fun. I love it. Uh, but as far as the government oversight and constitutional matters, I'm 100% there. That's, that's, what I, that's why I always tell, take people back to it. I said, your standards should not be your feelings, your emotions. Your standards should not be your party platform. Your standard should be the Constitution. It's the supreme law of the land. And frankly, if you want, we could get into a much deeper topic about it, but our nation was founded on Judeo-Christian values. That should be the moral standard. Now, people can sit there and say, oh, people, don't, we don't believe in God, everything. Well, that, we can have a conversation about that. But that used to be the standard of the founding. That was the standard of the founding fathers, and that was the standard for 170 years. You know, when we started, that began to eradicate itself. Actually, not even eradicate itself. It was attacked, and it was really beginning in the, showing its face in the 1930s and, and on since now. So, not to get too deep into that, but to simply say, we got to quit with the, the labeling for a second, you know, Th that's okay when you understand the, the, why that label's there, what purpose it serves. But we also need to understand natural rights. We need to understand these are fundamental principles that we as Americans should believe in and accept, and we don't. We're shutting people down now. We're shouting at people's faces. We're, we're burning cars. We're flipping them. We're assaulting, hurting people. People are getting, people are getting shot and stabbed because of this stuff, you know. And, uh, I mean, D Steve Scalise, Congress Congressman Scalise, just a oh year and a half Lord. ago on the ball field, just he's one of many. He's alive. Senator yeah. Rand Paul was tackled by his neighbor, broke ribs, nearly killed the guy. You know, there's these a lot of problems that are going on. So, again, a much deeper topic, but um, th th there are important discussions that have to be had, and we will have those with Patriot Initiative. We're going to begin re to train people in this. So. Excellent. So, in my, my particular workplace, Josh, um, I work in a union shop. And most of the people vote like in, in uh, like state and um, federal elections according to the union steward. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, they preach, vote your pocketbook or vote your wallet. And, you know, the money, the, the ones who say, you know, they're going to um, lower taxes and, and create more jobs, um, help, help the economy, um, I don't know, help the stock market, have good numbers and stuff like that. Do you think that should be the guiding light on, um, like, any state or federal election or local election? That, you know, I'm going to, you know, I support, you know, lower taxes and um, more jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I want to make sure I understand your question. Are you saying that really should that be the leading issue? Leading <clears throat> issue, yeah. Um, constitutionally speaking, yes. Culturally speaking, no. Does that make sense? Or should I explain that a little bit explain more? Explain that a little more. So 
Our culture is, I mean, I, we, I've sort of explained that throughout the show. Our culture is severely broken. Family values have been destroyed. We don't, we got kids that don't know their own identity. So when we start putting the focus of, on the money, right, and we start valuing jobs over family and stuff, uh, that's a problem. Now, constitutionally speaking, those issues like marriage and life, things like that, should never have been politicized from the start. That should have never been politicized. Government should have never gotten involved in those things, right? Um, and here we are. So now we do have to tackle those, those issues. And we do have to begin to strip away the, the power and authority of the, the federal and state government from these issues. You know, um, well, actually, and not to dive into it too much, but just to provide an example, like Roe v. Wade, it's been, always been assumed throughout U.S. history that life was protected. That was murder, right? And so then it became a political issue when it start when they redefined the narrative and said, "Oh, you're taking a woman's right to choose away." Well, when a woman's right to choose involves taking the human life, yes, that would be the case. Yeah, because life. Liberty, the pursuit of happiness, is a is a fundamental tenet espoused in the uh, Declaration of Independence. It's a natural right. So you can't violate natural rights. The government should be protecting that, right? So that's how that works. <clears throat> but as we move forward, um, kind of going off your question, yes, in a in a perfect, if you will, maybe not necessarily so perfect, but in a uh, constitutional society, in a, with a constitutional government that is of the people, by the people, for the people, bound to the Constitution we have currently writ written and abide by, yes, the leading issue should be taxes, should be um, government oversight, you know, the, the courts and what's going on, who should be appointed and whatnot. We should not be talking about... Uh, whether or not gender dysphoria is a real problem and, and whether or not we should be funding it, right? We should not be talking about whether or not we want to take the right to bear arms away. That should be not be a discussion. That should be squashed immediately, period. That is, you, you bring that up, no, that's a constitutional right, get over it, right? So boom, done. Um, I don't mind people bringing it up as a discussion, but hopefully people are smart enough to say, yeah, we disagree with that immediately because that's, again, a natural right, boom, squashed. But to talk about politically, talk about the tax code and things like that, and or, um, uh, zoning board ordinances, things like that, you know, the, the little things in society, those should be talked about. Yeah, those should be leading issues. But this is why we exist as the patron initiative to get people back and saying, we can't even vote in this, what I was talking about earlier, we can't even have conversations when we don't even have our foundation in the, in the first place put together. We're having discussions about fiscal policy when we are morally corrupted. Mm. that's the problem. Okay. We've got to get our mor morality back. We've got to get our foundation and principles aligned. We've got to get our families put back together. We need to know who we are as a nation and who we are as individuals and get our purpose back before we can have the discussion of how to get government out of our pocket. You know, For Christians who may be listening, I always ask them this, you know, specifically them because they're the ones that believe in the Bible and claim to believe in God. Yeah. I say, what happened to the love of money being the root of all evil? Because if you're voting in the precinct, right, and putting money first before all these other issues, there's an issue there, you know. Granted, they should be theoretically focusing on that when they're voting, but we've got cultural issues we have to deal with. So it's a very, it's a very complex topic. We could go further into more, but I, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Well, good segue to my next question here. Is marijuana legal yet in New Hampshire? It is not fully legal. It is medically legal. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think Massachusetts just made it legal in their state. They did make it legal. Massachusetts oh. made it legal. Yes. Uh. Yep. So the, we, the, the next domino to fall might be New Hampshire. Uh, very likely. Uh, the Democratic Party, uh, I believe that's part of their platform is they want to legalize it. And... Um, I suppose the next question will be, what are my thoughts on that? Because okay, that would be, yeah. be the next natural uh, way to go in the conversation. Um, I'll, I'll be totally honest, frankly speaking, right? Uh, frankly, yeah, okay. So uh, when, it, when I voted for every measure medically for marijuana to be used because I have seen studies, I've, I've done my research, and there are medical uses that work um, that has been proven uh, to help. Um, when it came up for a vote to fully legalize it, I did vote against it, and I, I had some people who got upset with me about it, and they said, you know, you of all people, I expect because you're a liberty person, 
I said, the reason why I voted against it was because I said, we're just not, culturally, we're, we'll, we will have a hard time bringing that into society with all the other problems we have. Having said that, I did tell them, I said, I wish I didn't have to vote against it because fundamentally, I don't believe that the government should have any right or I don't, I don't believe it has any authority over uh, taking whatever you smoke away, whatever you put inside your body. It shouldn't have any right to that. We don't ban alcohol, although we did go through prohibition and people probably still believe you should have it prohibited, right? But that's not the, that's not the uh, fundamental um, authority of government in purpose. That's not even the purpose at all of government, right? So, no. We shouldn't have to make it illegal. Uh, in a in a better world, I, I do. I think it should be legalized, yeah. Um, I just, at the time, based on my conscience and where I was, I said I just don't feel comfortable doing this. But that I do want to make it clear I do stand firm on the government not having the, that say. It shouldn't have that authority. Uh, culturally speaking, again, you, we got to separate what government authority versus culture. Culturally speaking, I wouldn't encourage anybody to smoke it. I would actually encourage them to go get healed by God, right? Yeah. I'd say go, go, go pray, come to the church about it. You know, um, if you if you feel the need, like you would pop a pop a pill, maybe an Advil, whatever, you need to go take it to to relieve some pain. Well, okay, fine, you know, but um, but yeah, th but that's a cultural problem we have to deal with, you know, because we abuse things. So, I mean, if you want to go smoke in your house, that's your prerogative, whatever. No, I don't believe the government should come eat, come in and, and uh, infiltrate that and get involved in that, even though, again, I did vote against the absolute legalization of it. And I've told people before, I said, I may not have been right on that. I don't know. That was just how I voted at the time. And I'm honest about that stuff, right? I'm not always right. But I'm very confident what I believe. I'm very confident where I stand on the issues and why I stand on the issues. So that's kind of my take on it. Another um, hot button issue, well, it, 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 sort of involving, and I'll, 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 I'll in, 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 um, inject the New Hampshire interest in this, is the wall along the southern border that there's a big stink about. Yeah. And our four legislators, um, Annie Custer and Chris Pappas, the representatives, and Janine Jean Jean Shaheen and uh, Maggie Hassan, the senators, I assume are all against the wall, mainly because Trump is proposing the wall. Right. But yet, if that's going to curb the opiate crisis, allegedly, the opiate intake, isn't New Hampshire hit worse than like the, the border states per capita, like Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California? I believe so. Well, then again, there's a heck of a lot more people in those four states than in New Hampshire. Right. But how does the heroin speaking. and the cocaine get up to New Hampshire? I don't know the answer to that question. I know that a lot of it floods in through Massachusetts. Okay. So there is that. <laughs> um... Let's go to the wall for a second, because that's okay. a really interesting topic. Uh, I have always told people, I said, look, I, I believe in secure borders. Now, people are probably going to think, oh, boy, he's leading up to saying he's against the wall. I'm not against a wall, per se. I think we should have a border again, and that's where I was going to go with it. I think we should have a, some sort of border, which we do up right now. And if we want to put a wall up, great. But the wall is not going to solve the problem. What's going to solve the problem is cutting welfare benefits. A wall does not incentivize immigrants to come over illegally. What incentivizes them to come over illegally are the welfare benefits we give. When they come into the nation, they're given all this free stuff, right? And the Democratic Party really loves to talk about this stuff. You know, we want to give them... They're, they're coming over, they're coming over for, from a terrible country, which is interesting because Donald Trump, President Trump, recently, you know, the last year, uh, said that they're... Uh, cruddy countries. We all put it very lightly. Right? He said they're bad countries. They're just a dump. But now the Democrats are admitting that they're coming over from bad countries, but they got mad at Trump when he said they were bad countries. You know, it's just, it's inconsistent. Yeah. So in any case, if we cut the welfare, if we cut the incentives from them coming over and say, you're not going to get anything. You come over to this border, you're going to have to work just like everybody else. They will stop coming over for that reason. Right? They'll come over, and we encourage them to come over. I would love for more people to come over from different countries. I think that's wonderful, because we're all human. We're all individuals. There are so many wonderfully good people that want to come to this country and, and uh, live out the American dream, build a new life. That is, that's awesome. That's what America is here for. We exist for that reason. But we do have laws, and we don't just bring in anybody. You know, you you got to kind of you've got to assimilate. You got you come under the the Constitution when you become a citizen. So 
back to the basics here, I do believe we should have some sort of border. If that ends up being a wall, cool, that's great. I mean, I don't really have a strong opinion on that. I have a stronger opinion on the fact that nobody's talking about the benefits, the welfare benefits that we're giving illegal immigrants. We're dipping into Social Security, the money you paid in and all the other generations have paid in, my grandparents, they're taking that money and giving it to immigrants who are coming over here illegally, bad people. I'm not saying that they're every immigrant's coming over. I'm, I'm especially talking about those who are actually committing crimes. Yeah. Aside from the crime of coming over illegally, right? In yeah. addition to that. So that's really the issue at hand, I think. I know. Well, there's a, um, a Democrat, a, a Democrat out of um, West Virginia. I think his name is Senator Joe Manchin. Manchin. Yeah. And he was in, in, in the past presidential election. Uh, Trump took West Virginia like 80 percent, 70 percent, something ridiculous like that. So Manchin voted for um, for the Supreme Court justices. Um, um, Gorsuch and uh, Kavanaugh, and saying, you know, and they're asking them, you know, why are you going against your party line? Saying, I'm going to vote for my constituents. I have to, you know, bypass my party lines here for the betterment of my constituents. So he voted for, for the Supreme Court, um, Trump's Supreme Court picks. I'm just saying that New Hampshire, the New Hampshire federal legislatures, if they're not going to vote for the wall per se, they should have some good solid opioid how to you know eliminate the opioid crisis in new in new hampshire um if they don't have any you know solutions um for that then i think they should go ahead and support the wall and go against party lines oh i agree uh yeah. the, the problem is again the <laughs> Our congresswomen and senators that represent New Hampshire are a b really great example of the broken culture we have. They are not basing their views on the Constitution or any moral code or anything of the sort, right? They're not basing their views on natural rights and defense of natural rights or any recognition of. They're basing it solely on we can't stand the guy in the White House, so we're going to oppose everything he does and says. That is a problem. Now, I'm going to play a little devil's advocate against myself here. Some people would say, well, you did that to Barack Obama. Yes, I did that to Barack Obama because my standard was the Constitution and the Bible, and Barack Obama, in every act, he opposed both of those. So, again, my standard doesn't change based on people. My, my standard is on documents in, in a book that has lasted through human history. And, and w when you're talking about the Constitution through American history, that's what I look at. My standard doesn't change. It stays the same, right? So, but theirs do. Their standard changes all the time. Whoever's in power, whatever the culture says go. I'm like, no, we, we should be guiding culture. That's what should be happening, right? And, and we're not. Those of us who are thinking straight, right? Those who have a standard of morality and a standard for law and, and what's good and, and, and wholesome. So that's what we're looking at. And this kind of goes, to again, to the Patriot Initiative, which I love. We want to include everybody, especially in these forums. We want to include everybody. Um, Democrat, Republican, just using the labels for the sake of the conversation. Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, whatever, you name it. Everybody comes in collectively and people get to be, the, the heart and the mind begin to shift there. And you facilitate these conversations where people can start to learn more and say, oh, that's interesting. That's what I always try to do when I'm talking to people. But people should know. I said, yeah, when you come in, though, I, I do have a position. I, I absolutely have a position. I, we have a vision. But we want everybody included. You, you can't change the culture without engaging everybody. Yeah. You know? That's, that's the fact. One more thing I sure. want to bounce off you before we get into our final comments here. The Mueller investigation. Oh, boy. Two years <laughs> now, two plus years. Well, no, no, a little less than two years. No, about two years uh -huh. that Trump has been a, the president. Is that a waste of money? I mean, if I'm get, on my job, if I don't meet, like, deadlines, I mean, I'm going to get disciplined or maybe even terminated mm -hmm. from my job. And I don't know. I mean, the investigation, I guess, has to take its course. I, I understand that. But, I mean, either there was Russian collusion with Trump or there was not. And I, I can't see what – that's just a total waste of money. Yeah, that's a deep issue. Probably not. I don't have a whole lot of time to go into it. Um, oh. But suffice it to say, 
it's very complex. It should be dealt with. There should be, if you, like you said, if there's Russian collusion or not. I personally don't think there is. I don't either. You know, well, if you want to look at Russian collusion, you can go back and look at some of the m members of a certain party. If you go back decades, Jane Fonda going over to places. I mean, you've got you've got a lot of history behind some of these people that have been in power for many decades, and they they did talk to Russians, but. It, it's really just a distraction. All that is a real distraction. Not saying that it's it's there aren't corrupt people like Mueller in there. Yeah. But we have a much more rooted and foundational problem that we have to to deal with, and that's the culture. If we get again, if we can begin to shift the culture, reteach responsibility, natural rights, the value of the Constitution. Um, what is your moral standard? What what did the Bible say? What did the founders believe in the Bible? Did they believe in the Bible? And did they is that where they got the principles of a constitutional republic that we live on under now? Right. Where did all that come from, and how does it apply to your everyday life today? Right? And then once that happens, you begin to inspire people and train people who are interested in getting involved in public leadership via politics and government. And uh -huh. that's, what, that's what we're aiming to do. So we want to equip people, young men and women as well as older, to, uh, to do that. Wow. Well, time flies when you're having fun, eh, Josh? My producer just told Absolutely. me we have about, oh, two minutes left till the sure. end of our uh, time here. Is there anything that you'd like to elaborate on that we talked about or anything we did not bring up, which you'd like to bring up now before we leave? Um, probably not enough time to talk about a number oh. of things other than to say that we do have a website. It's the Patriot Initiative USA.org. Go on that website. There's a place to donate if you'd like. Uh, we're always looking for that. Um, we have some forums coming up here very soon. You can follow us on Facebook as well, the Patriot Initiative on Facebook. And we are on Twitter. Uh, I say to follow it on Facebook and go to the website because we will be updating both of those very soon and then uh, Posting the event, we're going to have a forum in Hampton at the American Legion. We're going to be it's going to be on education. So we're going to talk. We have oh. three panelists, including myself. We're going to be talking about uh, sort of the, a little bit of the history of American education, where it started, how it started. And then we're going to talk about what went wrong and how to restore it. Excellent. Yep. And that, so do you have a set date for the Hampton yes, Forum? This, uh, yeah, it'll be February 8th, Friday, February 8th. Oh, okay. So, but we'll be updating and putting all the specific information, time and address and everything else like that on the, uh, both the website and the Facebook page. Okay, so um, I wish you the absolute best going you, forward. Frank. And it sounds like a great um, um, entity that you're running there. And um, we'll have to keep track on it. I might have to have you on again sometime to talk about your progress. I'd love it. It's okay. a fun thing to talk about. Excellent. So that's about it from this end, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for joining us, and please join us again for another episode of Frankly Speaking. Thank you very much. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.